Thank you for your patience and for helping us uh, help people find seats. Boy, we're glad to see you tonight. My name is Barbara Altman. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this event. We knew when we invited Wade Davis that he would find an appreciative crowd here, and we were not mistaken. So we're very happy to have you. This year, we're doing a somewhat different kind of series. So at every one of our talks, I've been asking for a show of hands. Would those of you who are here for your very first Oregon Humanity Center event, would you raise your hand? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Wade, thank you. <laughs> that is just great news. So I hope this will have put the Humanity Center series on your map, on your radar screen, and that you'll continue to pay attention to the folks we're bringing in. This is our logo. I'll be the Vanna White of the University of Oregon, for those of you who remember who Vanna White is. Um, we are the Oregon Humanity Center. We're an independent research center here on campus. And this is this year's theme, being a human, human being. You may want to know, this is a sneak preview, next year's theme is vulnerable. Just that one word. So we'll see what kind of a program we'll have for you for next year. Okay, so I'm very happy to welcome those of you who came in time to find seats in this main room. All of those people in the overflow room upstairs and those who are watching on our live streaming feed. You, will, you might be interested to know that at our last lecture last month with Dr. Ira Biok, we had so many people on our live streaming feed that we crashed the server. <laughs> so with, uh, with the result that the University of Oregon is now providing us with a larger capacity server to do this. So you're helping us build just a wonderful audience. I have the privilege of introducing this evening's speaker, but I'm going to keep it brief so that we have as much time as possible for our guest, Wade Davis, who is our Cressman lecturer for 2012-13. The Luther S. and Dorothy Cecilia Cressman lecture was established in 1994 with a bequest from former UO anthropology professor and archeologist Luther S. Cressman. He was the person who excavated the now famous 10,000 year old sagebrush bark sandals from a cave in central Oregon in 1938. Cressman questioned some of the received theories about the prehistory of the Northwest, the Great Basin, and pushed forward in a very important way our understanding of the human history of this particular region. The lecture's goal is, and I quote, and you will see why this fits Wade Davis to a T, the presentation and illumination of fundamental humanities issues that confront, but are too often ignored by, societies centrally occupied with science, technology, and business." End of quotation. We have used this lectureship for speakers in the fields of anthropology, religion, art and art history, natural history, and cultural studies. Among the guests who have come as Cressman lecturers are Francis Moore LePay, author of The Influential Diet for a Small Planet, and Terry Tempest Williams, author, conservationist, and activist. You might remember them here in 2011. I'm sure that Luther Cressman would have hardly approved the choice of Wade Davis to continue the distinguished spe speakers list. It's hard to introduce someone like Davis for whom any one label is hopelessly inadequate. He moves easily and with great recognition in both academic and more popular cultural circles, reaching audiences through every conceivable form of media. Among the key words that describe what he does are anthropologist, ethnobotanist, author, and photographer, and of course his official status as National Geographic Explorer in Residence is just about the best job title ever. His many honorary degrees, writing prizes, memberships, and affiliations are so numerous that it would take all night for me to recite them, so I simply advise you to look him up for more details. As a shorthand bio, I'm going to borrow some language from a recent article about Davis in Men's Journal. This was a piece in May 2012, and they headlined the article, the blood-drinking, psychedelic, toad-smoking, voodoo-inspired adventurers of explorer Wade Davis. <laughs> it, <laughs> I, 
I just gave up and didn't try to top that. A Canadian, Davis has retained deep roots in British Columbia, even though he travels the world extensively in his many different kinds of field work. His books, which number well over a dozen, range over a surprisingly broad variety of cultural, historical, and scientific projects. The most recent include Into the Silence, The Great War, Mallory and the Conquest of Everest. Then there's River Notes, A Natural and Human History of the Colorado. And I think the most recent is The Sacred Headwaters. Is that right, Wade? Is that the most recent or almost? The man's so prolific, it's hard to tell. But The Sacred Headwaters is subtitled The Fight to Save the Stikine, the Skeena, and the Nas. It's a return to British Columbia, his home, and exposes the danger posed to the headwaters of those three rivers named in the title, which are threatened by industrial development. The photographs in that book and in others are simply stunning. Tonight's talk will draw on material Davis engaged in his book from 2009, The Wayfinders, Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in a Modern World, and deals with the disappearance of cultures and languages, a loss that deeply impoverishes the rest of the world. I'll turn the mic over to Davis in just a moment, but I'm going to pause for a few practical details. I want to remind you, if you didn't know, that this Cressman Lecture is part of our year-long series on the topic Human Being Being Human, we began this investigation of the communication of, of the human condition across the disciplines with a talk in November by civil rights activist and lawyer Michelle Alexander, who spoke on the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness. Then last month, we hosted Dr. Ira Bayok on uh, end of life issues. And we'd like to invite you to the two remaining major lectures in the series, which are the following. Next month, March 5th at 7.30 here, we'll have David Eagleman, neuroscientist and director of Laboratory for Perception and Action at Baylor College of Medicine, who will give a talk related to his recent book, Incognito, The Secret Lives of the Brain. And then on May 29th, we'll end this series with Jonathan Haidt, who studies morality and emotion, with a presentation on the righteous mind, why good people are divided by politics and religion. And Haidt will also speak in Portland the following day, May 30th. So May 29th, Eugene, May 30th, Portland. If you'd like more information on those lectures or anything else the Oregon Humanities Center does, please look at our table in the main lobby outside the big doors where you came in and add your name to our mailing list, electronic or paper copy, if you'd like. I want to acknowledge my wonderful colleagues at the center who made all of this happen. We're, we're all wearing name tags, so if you have questions, stop any one of us and, and ask uh, for information. I'm happy to say that the Oregon Humanities Center is now a participating member of the Oregon Cultural Trust. Outside on our table, you will see the, uh, the our envelope, the Oregon Humanities Center envelope, and a small informational flyer on the Oregon Cultural Trust. When you make a gift to the Humanities Center and make a subsequent matching gift to the Oregon Cultural Trust, you are eligible to receive a 100% tax credit on your gift to the trust. Find out more at culturaltrust.org, or we can give you a phone number, or see the envelopes and the brochures upstairs on the table. We'd like to acknowledge our communications partner, Oregon Humanities. You might know them as OHUM. They are formerly the Oregon State Council on the Humanities housed in Portland. They've been wonderful about helping us get the word out about our programming across the state and in the city of Portland. I also want to be sure to mention that tonight's talk is presented in association with National Geographic Live, a mission program of speakers and events that brings the National Geographic experience to communities across the nation. You will have seen that there's a book display in the lobby with Mr. Davis's books, and Davis will sign books down here after the lecture and question and answer will bring down a small table for him to be seated at, and it's on your left after the talk. For the question and answer series, you will see two microphones at the base of the stairs in both central aisles. Please come to one of the mics if you'd like to ask a question. We're also very happy to bring a cordless mic to you if you can't or prefer not to come down to the front. Okay, um, 
that is the last of the housekeeping. We're ready for our presentation, which is entitled The Wayfinders, Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in a Modern World. And please help me with a warm welcome for adventurer extraordinaire, Wade Davis. Thank you. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thank, thanks very much, Barbara. You know, everybody here in Eugene keeps asking me about smoking toad. Uh, I, I, I knew I was going to have a sympathetic audience. <laughs> you know, one of the uh, intense pleasures of travel, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel their past in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, and taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that in the Amazon, jaguar shamans still journey beyond the Milky Way, or that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning, or that in the Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember the central revelation of anthropology, and that is the idea that the world into which you were born does not exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality, the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your cultural lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder in the slopes of Shomolungma, Mount Everest, or an eagle hunter of Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof shaman of Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of being, other ways of thinking, other ways of orienting yourself in social, spiritual, ecological space. And that's an idea that, if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now, together, the myriad of cultures of the world make up a, a web of life that surrounds a planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as is the biological web of life that you know so well as the biosphere. And you could think of this cultural web of life as being an ethnosphere. And you could define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, ideas and intuition, myths and possibilities brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative and imaginative species. And just as the biosphere is being severely impacted with the loss of habitat and the concomitant loss of plant and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere, but if anything, of course, at a far greater rate. No biologist, for example, would dare suggest that 50% of all plants and animals are moribund or on, on the brink of extinction because it simply is not true. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great, the great indicator of that, of course, the canary in the coal mine, is language loss. When each of you in this room were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Now, language isn't just vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. Every language is an old-growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social, spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages spoken the day that most of us in this room were born, today fully half aren't being whispered into the ears of children. There's an absolute and haunting consensus amongst academic linguists that this statistic is actually the case. Now, there are many people who say, well, wait a minute, what's the problem with that? I mean, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier for us to get along? And my answer to that is always to say, what a brilliant idea, but let's, let's make that inter international language a niptituck. Let's make it Haida, let's make it Lakota, let's make it Tibetan. And suddenly you begin to feel, as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. And yet that dreadful plight is indeed the fate of somebody somewhere on earth 
roughly every fortnight, because on average every two weeks, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. And the reason this is such a tremendous tragedy in our era, it, because it's happening just as geneticists have finally proven it to be true, what anthropologists have always intuited to be true, and what philosophers have always dreamt to be true. And that is the fact that we're all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean, quite literally, we are all cut from the same genetic cloth. Studies of the human genome leave no doubt whatsoever that the genetic endowment of humanity is a single continuum. Race is an utter fiction. Indeed, we are all descended from a handful of people who walked out of the Rift Valley of Africa some 60,000 years ago and then embarked on a journey, a diaspora that lasted 40,000 years, 2,500 human generations to carry the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But if you recognize the scientific truth that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, you also have to embrace its corollary. And that is the fact that all human populations, by definition, share the same raw genius, the same mental acuity, the same fundamental human potential. And whether this potential is exercised in technological wizardry, as has been the great achievement in the West, or by contrast, invested into unraveling the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no evolutionary progression in the affairs of culture. There is no ladder to success that goes from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand in London. That old idea that there was this pyramid of, of success that plopped Victorian England at the apex and the slopes of which went down to the so-called primitives of the world has been thoroughly discredited, uh, shown to be as much an artifact of the 19th century as the idea that clergymen had in that era that the earth was only 6,000 years old. In this stunning affirmation of the human spirit, geneticists have proven the essential interconnectedness of the human species. But what this fundamentally means then is that the other cultures of the world aren't failed attempts at you, uh, being you. They're not failed attempts at being modern. On the contrary, each is a fundamental answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the myriad of cultures of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices. And those voices collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us as a species in the ensuing millennia. But the challenge is then, what do we do about this? You know, in the realm of biological diversity, if you identify an area of high species endemism, you can create a protected area. But you can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't freeze people in time like some kind of zoological specimen. And so 10 years ago, when I was recruited to the National Geographic, 12 years ago now, um, as part of this entire conservation initiative, my mandate from the society was to help them change the way the world viewed and valued culture in a decade. And it was an ambitious goal but it was based on the thought that polemics are never persuasive, politicians follow but never lead, but storytellers can change the world. And so I embarked on a series of, if you will, expeditions into the ethnosphere to take our incredible audience, 165 languages around the world, 250 million people a month plugging into some outlet of the National Geographic, taking them to places where the cultural practices were so incredibly dazzling that you couldn't help but come away with this new appreciation of the wonder of culture. So what, what, what did that mean in real terms? Well, for example, I, I made a film on the science of the mind of Tibetan Buddhism. Well, you know His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama always refers to Buddhism as a science, and that may strike us as strange because we're not used to using that term for what we think of as a religion, but what, after all, is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? And what is Tibetan Buddhism but 2,500 years of direct empirical observation as to the nature of mind? 
Mathieu Ricard, a close friend of mine with whom I made a film on the science of the mind of Tibetan Buddhism, used to say to me that, you know, Western science is too often a major response to minor needs. We spend all of our lifetime trying to live to be 100 without losing our teeth. He said, we in Tibet spend all of our lifetime trying to understand the nature of existence. He said that, he said, billboards in the West celebrate naked teenagers in underwear. Our billboards in Tibet are mani walls, prayers for the liberation of all sentient creatures. And so I, this exemplified this sort of jur- set of journeys that we did. And I want tonight to take you to, on some of these journeys that were so extraordinary. And let's begin by entering the largest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination, Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon the southern sea. The greatest culture sphere in the history of humanity. And recently, I was invited by the Polynesian Voyaging Society to sail with their cadre on the Hokalea, uh, a reconstructed catamaran based on the drawings that Joseph Banks did when he sailed as a naturalist under the command of Captain James Cook. And the Hokalea is named after the sacred star of Hawaii, and it's emerged as a symbol of cultural renewal, not just in the Hawaiian Islands, but throughout Polynesia. And even today, the sailors of the Polynesian Voyaging Society can readily name 300 stars in the night sky. They can sense the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon simply by watching the reverberation of waves across the hull of their vessel, knowing full well that every island group in the Pacific has its own unique refractive pattern that can be read with the perspicacity with which a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. These are sailors who, in the darkness of the hull of the vessel, can sense as many as five or six sea swells moving through the canoe at any one point in time, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the ocean and can be followed with the same ease with which a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. But the most amazing thing about this tradition is that it was all based on dead reckoning. And dead reckoning means that you only know where you are by remembering precisely how you got there. And it was the impossibility of using dead reckoning on a long oceanic voyage that kept most European transports hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of the chronometer. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before Christ, the ancestors of the Polynesians emerged from a civilization we call Lepita, off the shores of New Caledonia and New Guinea, and they set sail into the rising sun. They reached Tonga and Samoa in about a thousand years, and then the diaspora simply stopped for a millennium, and then it moved again, 4,000 kilometers across the central Pacific through the Cook Islands, the Society Islands, eventually reaching the Marquesas, and then they moved northwest, discovering Hawaii, southeast to Easter Island or Rapa Nui. And all of this was based on dead reckoning, and that meant that the navigator had to sit monk-like on the stern of the vessel, never disturbed by a member of the crew, remembering in his mind or and imagination every shift of wind, every shift of current, every sign of the sea, the stars, the celestial bodies, the animals of the ocean, the birds of the sky. And Nainoa Thompson, even to make it more beautiful, the metaphor was that the ship never moved at all. It was the axis mundi. It was a center pole of existence, and it was the role of the navigator to conjure the islands out of the sea, to pull the islands out of the ocean. And Nainoa, as captain of the Hokalea, decided on an extraordinarily ambitious journey when he was going to pull Rapa Nui out of the sea. This implied sailing from Oahu 6,000 miles across the doldrums, tacking into the wind for 2,500 miles, all to reach an island 25 kilometers across, less than a degree on a compass, had a compass been on board. But there are no compasses or sextons or devices of any sort on board the Hokalea, only the ancient techniques of navigation and the hopes and prayers and spirit of entire civilization whose culture is being reborn with the wind of the sails of the Hokalea. They reached all the way close to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, 
and I know I fell asleep. This is death to an expedition. And he awoke and he knew he, was, he didn't know where he was. He was mist and shrouded. He had no idea what to do. And he remembered what his teacher told him is that you already have found your island because the island is a vessel. And he then totally relaxed and suddenly a beam of sunlight came through the sky and hit his shoulder. And he just decided to sail after that beam and he went right to Rapa Nui. <laughs> so if we leave the greatest ocean sphere, let's enter for a moment the greatest forest sphere, the Amazon rainforest. The greatest forest on Earth, a forest the size of the continental United States, more poetically put, the size of the face of a full moon. Joseph Conrad famously said that the tropical rainforest was not a forest at all. It was simply a, a remnant of an ancient era when vegetation rioted and consumed the world. And if we enter the banks of the Amazon, we come to a people like the Barasana, a people who believed that mythologically they came up the Milk River from the east in the belly of the sacred serpent, the Anaconda, only to be regurgitated under the various affluents of the rivers of the northwest Amazon, a, a people who live so closely to the forest that cognitively they do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the rainforest. Or if we move a little south down the edge of the Cordillera, we enter the homeland of one of the most extraordinary societies I ever lived with, the Warani. And what made the Warani so interesting to me is that they were first peacefully contacted in 1958, fully five years after I was born. In 1957, five missionaries attempted contact and made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by ten glossy photographs of themselves in what we would say to be friendly gestures, forgetting that the people of the rainforest had never seen anything two-dimensional in their lives. So they picked up the photographs from the forest floor, looked behind the face to try to find the form to the figure, found nothing, and concluded that these were calling cards from the devil, and they promptly speared the five missionaries to death. But the Warani didn't just spear outsiders. We traced genealogies back eight generations and found out that 54% of their mortality was due to them spearing each other. In fact, we only found two cases of natural death, and when we pressured the fellows about it a little bit, they admitted that one of the fellows had gotten so old that he died getting old, so we speared him anyway. <laughs> but they had a knowledge of the rainforest that was extraordinary. Their hunters could smell animal urine at 40 paces and tell you what species of life had left that behind, not because they were sauvage in a Rousseauian sense, but because they were true natural philosophers who had paid attention to a forest homeland upon which their lives depended. And it's precisely this acute knowledge of the environment of the Amazon that led to the remarkable knowledge of ethnopharmacology and ethnobotany. And I was very fortunate at, at Harvard to fall into the orbit of the legendary plant explorer, Richard Evans Schultes, the man who had sparked the psychedelic era by discovering the so-called magic mushrooms in 1938. Uh, in, in, uh, before that, he had traveled west to Kiowa country uh, to study the peyote cult, and as a young boy who had never been west of the Charles River, he found himself taking peyote five nights a week for eight weeks of his young life. It was curious because he was an odd choice to become a 60s icon. His politics were wildly conservative. He didn't vote for the P Republican Party. He professed not to believe in the American Revolution. He always voted for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, <laughs> And one of his colleagues said the only way for Schultes to go native would be to go to London. And I, I didn't know any of this history when I whimsically decided to go to the Amazon, uh, knowing nothing about the Amazon and less about botany, but I rapped on his fourth floor eerie office door one day, and I got as far as saying, sir, I'm from British. Well, that's all it took. That adjective, I'm from British Columbia, I've saved up money in a logging camp, I want to go to the Amazon as you did and collect plants. Well, if I had done that at a Canadian university, I would have been thrown out, at the very least ask about my credentials, what courses I had taken. And instead, the man who had slipped away into the Amazon and lived there 12 uninterrupted years, traveling down unknown rivers, living amongst unknown peoples, all the time enchanted of the wonder of the neotropical rainforest, the man who in time would collect 35,000 numbers of plants discovered 2,000 previously unreported medicinal plants and 350 species unknown to science, 
a man for whom mountains had been named in South America and national parks, he simply peered across a mound of plant specimens through his antiquated bifocals and said very simply, well, son, when do you want to go? <laughs> and two weeks later, I was in the Amazon. In order to placate my mother, um, who was a little, old, little English lady back in Victoria, British Columbia, I stopped by his office on the eve of my departure, and, and uh, he had three critical pieces of advice. He said, don't bother with leather boots, because all the snakes bite at the neck. And then he... <laughs> And then he said, I shouldn't forget to bring a pith helmet because, you know, he'd never lost his bifocals in 12 years. And his third piece of advice most assuredly did not placate my mother. He said, don't come back without trying ayahuasca, which is the most potent of the hallucinogenic preparations of the shaman's repertoire. But he also said to remember the adage of the Swiss scholar Paracelsus, who said the difference between a poison, a medicine, a narcotic, a hallucinogen is simply dosage. And so he said, always be on the outlook for any biodynamic plants. And that's what we really were trying to do. And so, for example, the photograph here shows an old friend of mine making the flying death, Karari, the arrow poisons that revolutionized modern medicine in the 1940s when they yielded the powerful muscle relaxant d 2 Kararine. And this ethnopharmacological research invariably led into the, us into the realm of the shaman. Now, the shaman's been a much misunderstood figure, and if you follow the writings of those legendary uh, ethnographers such as Shirley MacLaine, you would think that the shaman, <laughs> the shaman is a kind of benign grandfather figure with bells and whistles who sings a lot. Um, I've been with a lot of shaman, and I've never met one who wasn't a little psychotic. That's their job. Uh, they're the ones who swim in the mystic waters the rest of us would drown in, as Joseph Campbell said. They're the ones who go to the metaphysical spaces that most of us want to ignore as we're raising our families. And the essence of the shamanic art of healing is based on a very different notion of the nature of disease, whereby disease is not defined as the presence of pathogens, but as a state of disequilibrium or imbalance that must be addressed through the shamanic art of healing. And the essential act of uh, the shamanic um, uh, therapeutic treatment is the moment when the shaman, him or her, invokes some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance to get into those distant metaphysical realms where he or she can work their deeds of metaphysical, magical, and medical rescue. And that accounts for one of the curious anomalies in botanical science, and that is the fact that of the 120 known hallucinogenic plants, fully 95% of them are from the Americas. Not because the forests of Equatorial West Africa or Southeast Asia are depauperate, but simply because people there had other avenues to the divine, as we'll see in a moment. But in the Americas, the route to the Godhead was always mediated by these curious plants, like this one, Ebene, in a photograph that Schultes took in the 1950s, the semen of the sun, blown up the nose of the indigenous people, the Yanomami. This is a powder made from the blood-red resin of several species in the, in the genus Varola in the nutmeg family, uh, chock full of powerful tryptamines, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, dimethyltryptamine, to have this stuff blown up your nose is like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with broke paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. Um, it, creates, it creates not the distortion of reality, it creates the utter disillusion of reality. In fact, I used to argue with Professor Schultes, you couldn't call this hallucinogenic because by the time you're under its influence, there was no one home anymore to experience the hallucinations. <laughs> But the reason we're interested in these dazzling uh, plants is not just their pharmacological properties, but what they tell us about a different way of knowing. The reason people blow that snuff up the nose is that tryptamines are like brain serotonin. Serotonin is a tryptamine, and they're orally inactive. You can take as much as you want through the mouth, and nothing will happen to you because the tryptamines are denatured by an enzyme found in the human stomach called monoamine oxidase. They can only be taken orally if taken in conjunction with some other compound that denatures momentarily that enzyme found in the human gut. Well, ayahuasca is not a plant, it's a preparation. On the one hand, the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the coffee family in the genus Psychotria, these leaves are chock full of those very tryptamines, but the other ingredient is a woody liana, which contains beta carbolines, harmine and harmaline, and these are MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate 
the tryptamines found in the leaf. So you don't have to worry about that chemistry, but you have to ask the interesting question, how in a flora of 80,000 species of vascular plants did the indigenous people learn to combine these morphologically distinct denizens of the rainforest in this interesting way to create the biochemical version of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts? The only scientific explanation is trial and error, which is quickly exposed statistically to be a meaningless euphemism. And you ask the Indians, and they say that plants teach us. Well, what does that mean? Oops, what happened? Did we lose? Can we get this back on? So Schultes, when he was with the Siona Sequoia in, uh, let's see if we can just, when he was with the Siona Sequoia in, uh, in 1941, they had 17 different varieties of the woody liana, all of which were referable to his Harvard-trained eye as the same species, and yet they distinguished them consistently at great distances in the forest. And when he asked them the nature of their classification, they looked at him as if he was a fool who knew nothing about plants, and then they remarked that you took each one of them on the night of a full moon, and each one sang to you in a different key. Well, that wasn't going to get you a PhD in plant systematics at Harvard, <laughs> but it was a whole lot more interesting than counting flower parts. So let's just see if we can see what's... Oh, did you just run out of battery in your laptop? That's bad preparation. <laughs> bad, bad, bad. I, I can just keep going. I'm Irish, no problem. <laughs> but one thing I wanted, to, one, one thing I wanted to, to comment on is that our entire notion of... It, it's really fascinating, you know, you should always challenge scientific or academic orthodoxy, and all of you grew up with this idea the Amazon was a delicate, fragile place that could only endure our ways for so long. And that notion made a certain amount of sense, but it was based on a book published in 1952 by a man called Richards, where he was simply trying to distinguish the difference between a temperate and a tropical rainforest. And he noted quite properly that in a temperate rainforest with the periodicity of the seasons, the leaf litter accumulates and the soil becomes a biological capital of the ecosystem, whereas in the tropical system, with a high rate of humidity and decomposition, the living vegetation itself is, is, is a bank of the system. And so remove that, um, living vegetation, and you can set in motion, as we all said in our papers in the 1970s, a kind of chain reaction of biological destruction of great cataclysmic consequences. Well, this was reasonable as a way of understanding the difference between these two systems, but when applied to a landmass seven times the size of the province of Ontario, it was as much slogan as science. And 50 years of field research has shown that the Amazon, in fact, was a completely diverse place as it is today. A third of it is savanna. There are areas of land collectively the size of France of rich black soil of human origin. And that idea of the Amazon as a fragile place worked and fed into our concerns, legitimate concerns as environmentalists as of the encroachment of the Brazilian frontier. But critically, and more importantly for this discussion tonight, it fed into our notion uh, as to what it meant to live in the Amazon. And all our notions of life in the Amazon in pre-Columbian times was based on our experience with the marginal societies. I don't mean marginal like primitive, literally the societies that lived along the margin of the of the basin at the flanks, the lower eastern flank of the Cordillera. Remember, the Andes weren't traversed by roads till the 1940s. Geography and cataracts kept those societies isolated and protected from the east. And these societies, like the Warani, tended to be endogenous, marrying amongst themselves, living in open conflict with their neighbors. And that became our symbol of what the Amazon was. You may remember books like Amazonia, a counterfeit paradise. But all of this was in 
defiance of the obvious. All you had to do is read the journals of Aureliana, who sailed down the Amazon in 1541, and he didn't sail through an empty forest, he sailed through millions of people. And so the question has always been, is there a place where the ancient rhythms of those great civilizations of the Amazon may still be heard? And the answer is that there is, and it's in the homeland of the people of the Anaconda. These societies, now let's see, now we've got a little problem with this guy. This is not working. Um, what's that? Well, then I'm not gonna have a microphone. Is this, did you just not, is there a problem? But, the, but the, so the incredible thing is these societies are quite unlike the Warani. These are societies that don't honor the warrior, they honor the man of wisdom. They're societies that are based on deep um, uh, um, initiatory processes of, 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 of intense Baroque um, religiosity. They have social structures that facilitate peace, not war, not the least of which is a rule that you must marry someone who speaks a different language. And so in any one, let's see if this works. There we go. So in any one, in, thank you. So in any one long house, you'll have six and seven languages spoken, but you never hear a child practicing a distinct tongue. They simply watch, wait, listen, and one day begin to speak. And what we've come to understand is that the mythology of the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana and the Makuna, literally is uh, a land management plan that shows you exactly how people in huge numbers can live in the Amazon rainforest. And the reason this is so poignant is that when I first lived in the northwest Amazon of Colombia, an area the size of France, in the 70s, it felt like all these societies were slipping away. And in fact, a friend of mine, Stephen Hugh Jones, the head of anthropology at Cambridge, made a film in the early 1970s called Disappearing Worlds about the Barasana. And and then a, an amazing thing happened. You know, people are always saying, what can we do to, to reverse this trend I'm, this, I'm, I'm mentioning to you? The first thing is give the people back their land. And an amazing thing happened in Colombia where a president by the name of Virgilio Barco turned to a friend of mine, Martin Van Hildebrand, who was an anthropologist, and the president didn't know anything about Indians except that he liked Indians. And he said, Martin, do something for the people. And in five incredible years, Martin did more than something. He secured land, legal land tenure to an area of land collectively the size of the United Kingdom for 57 ethnicities in the northwest Amazon of Colombia. And then behind a veil of isolation created by the troubles of contemporary Colombia, where the federal state had no presence in the rainforest, a whole new dream of culture was reborn. So in the middle of making this film, The People of the Anaconda, Stephen flew in from Cambridge and he couldn't believe his eyes. There was a longhouse three times the size of this room 250 men in full regalia, taking ayahuasca for three days and three nights in a celebration of the essence of femininity, of cassava woman, a fertility rite for the harvest of manioc. And he couldn't help himself. He got on the phone to Christine, his wife back in Cambridge, and said, Christine, you won't believe my eyes. The only thing that disappeared were the fucking missionaries. <laughs> but this is, a, this is a really poignant thing because a great Canadian native elder once said to me, there are only three questions in life. Who am I, where do I come from, where am I going? At this point of European contact, it wasn't just diseases that killed 90% of the people. It wasn't just the triumph of ideology implicit in the power of the Christian church. It was that the conqueror said to the people of the forest, the questions you've had, the answers you've had for those three questions for all of your lifetime have been wrong. So when we asked the elders in the wake of this renaissance, why was it that you put up with this nonsense from the missionaries, they said something very profound to us. They said, because they promised they could make us human. And that's how much they had come to believe that they had lost their essence. But of course, all of this now is being reborn in a complete new, new dream of the earth in the Northwest Amazon, one of the great symbols of hope in South America. 
Now, I mentioned Professor Schultes. I, I failed to mention that as I left his office, he gave me two letters that might as well have been written by God, or at least Charles Darwin, for the doors they would open in South America. And he said, I should look up his man in Columbia, Timothy Plowman. Timothy was his protege, the finest botanist of his generation. And Schultes had done for Timothy the impossible. He had secured the dream academic grant of the 1970s, a quarter million dollars, a lot of money in those days, and a brand new red, fire red, engine red Dodge pickup truck uh, for an expedition to study a plant known to the Inca as the divine leaf of immortality, coca, the notorious source of cocaine. And it was an extraordinary assignment because we knew that this was a plant that had yielded our most important topical anesthetic, cocaine hydrochloride, essential in nose, throat, and ear surgery and ophthalmology. And yet, amazingly little was known about the plant. Nobody knew its point of origin. Nobody knew um, how many species yielded the drug. Nobody knew anything about the ethnopharmacology of coca. No one had ever done a nutritional study of the plant, even though it was consumed every day by millions of South American people. We knew that in the time of the Inca, it was revered as no other plant. You could not approach a holy shrine if you didn't have coca in your mouth. Unable to cultivate the plant at the elevation of the imperial capital of Cusco, the Inca replicated it in gold and silver leaf in fields that, hover, that covered the, colored the horizon. And we knew that today in the Andes, no gesture occurred without some reciprocal exchange of the energy of this leaf with the apus, the deities, the mountain deities that direct the destiny of every child. No field could be harvested, no child being brought into the realm of the living, no elder led into the realm of the dead with some, without some kind of mediation of this remarkable plant. We knew that distances were measured not in kilometers or miles, but in cockatoos. We knew that when people met on the trail, they didn't shake hands, they exchanged leaves. And we did do the first nutritional study of coca, and what we discovered horrified our backers of the U.S. government, because we found out it had a small amount of cocaine hydrochloride, roughly half to 1% dry weight, roughly the amount of, that you would find of caffeine in a coffee bean, and no one noticed the um, irony that at every drug abuse conference, all the DEA agents and narcs bolted for the coffee pot at 10 o'clock in the morning. But in addition to the small amount of alkaloid absorbed benignly in the mucous membrane of the mouth, coca was chock full of vitamins. It had more calcium than any plant ever studied by science, which made it perfect for a diet that lacked a dairy product, particularly for young mothers with infants. It also had enzymes in it which enhanced the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, which made it perfect for the tuber-based diet of the Andes. So in one elegant scientific assay, we put into stark profile the draconian efforts that are underway to this day to eradicate the traditional fields, and we showed that this was a plant that had been used with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, uh, for over 4,000 years by the people of the Andes. And so over the course of this two-year investigation, with coca both metaphorically and literally my lens upon this culture, the ancient rhythms of the Andes came into focus, and I became very interested in this notion of sacred geography. And again, not in the sense of hippie ethnography, but what does it mean to be a child raised to believe that a mountain is not a pile of in inner, inner rock ready to be mined, as I was raised in Canada to believe, but rather that a mountain was a deity that would direct his or her destiny. You know, I was raised in the forests of British Columbia to believe that those forests existed to be cut. That was the ideology of modern scientific forestry that I studied in school and practiced in the woods as an engineer for M Macmillan Blodell. That made me very different than my friends in the Quagulth Nation who believed those same forests were the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven and the cannibal spirits that dwelt at the north end of the world, spirits that would have to be embraced during the Hamatsa initiation such that the wisdom of the wild would come back to the community in the potlatch. Now the issue isn't who's right and who's wrong. Is that forest mere cellulose and bored feet? Is it the domain of the spirits? The interesting observation is how the belief system mediates the interaction with the natural world of that particular culture with profoundly different consequences for the ecological footprint. My culture in but three generations had torn those ancient forests asunder 
whereas my friends amongst the First Nations had ancestors that lived there for centuries, indeed for millennia. So I became very interested in how these notions of reciprocity played out in ritual. And in the Andes, it shouldn't surprise us that people have a, a very strong sense of the earth being alive, dynamic, responsive, because after all, the land itself shakes with earthquakes, uh, landslides, uh, they can see clouds condense to give rain to bring fertility to the fields. They can see how the agricultural labor of a year can be swept away in a day by a frost or a hailstorm. And so there's this complete sort of sense of reciprocity that plays out at every single level of the society, and it plays out in ritual. And one of the most remarkable rituals that I participated in is called the movimiento. And in the beautiful Andean village of Chinchero, side of the summer palace of Topa Inca Yupanqui, the second of the great Incan rulers. There only were three. Uh, once each year, the fastest young boy in every hamlet is given the honor of becoming a woman. And he puts on the clothing of his sister or his mother, and he becomes a transvestite figure known as a Wailaka. And then he must carry the banners of the community and lead all able-bodied men on a run. But it's not your ordinary run. You start off at 11,500 feet, you run 2,000 feet down to the base of the sacred mountain on Tequilica, and then you run to 16,000 feet, and then you fall off to the sacred valley and you cross two more soaring Andean ridges over the course of a long 24-hour ritual event. The entire perimeter of the run is marked by mounds of earth, mojones or itos, where the walaka must spin to bring the vortex of the feminine to the mountaintop, where coca is given to Pachamama, libations of alcohol to the wind. And the whole metaphor is that you go into the mountain as an uh, individual, but through sacrifice, and sacrifice comes from the Latin to make sacred, you emerge as a single pulse, a single community that has once again reaffirmed your sense of place on the planet and your commitment to that place on the planet. And at the age of 48, I became the oldest person ever to run the run and the only outsider ever to do it. And I only got through it by chewing more coke in one day <laughs> than anyone in the 4,000 year history of the planet. But what actually... <laughs> But what actually got me through it is that for 35 years, I had baptized, um, not 35 years, for 25 years, I had baptized children in Chinchero, and I had helped them go to school and bought cows for the family and pencils. And when all of my ahados and ahadas learned that their padrino was stupid enough to run the movimiento at the age of 48, they come out to the race from all quarters of the valley, and they clung to me like limpets for the entire day. They weren't about to let anything happen to their cash cow. <laughs> now, now, these localized rituals become Pan-Andean in these grand, fantastic festivals like the Koyariti, which happens once each year when the Pleiades re-emerge in the sky just before the holiday of Corpus Christi, and tens of thousands of indigenous people from all over the southern Andes converge on a sacred mountain dominated by three tongues of a glacier. It's a perfect example of the fusion of the syncretic world of the Andes today, 500 years of Catholic faith on top of centuries of pre-Columbian um, uh, antecedents. And so the ritual seems like a Catholic event. The crosses of the community are carried up through the stations of the cross, but it all occurs in the shadow of the most sacred mountain of the Inca, Ausangati. So the Pablitos then carry the crosses up to the ice, they're put in the ice for 24 hours, and then energized by Pachamama, and then carried off the next day. Now these events can even allow us to begin to and deconstruct such well-known sites as Machu Picchu. How many of you have been to Machu Picchu? How many of you were told it was a lost city? It was only a lost city in the fantasies in the marketing department of the National Geographic. Uh, if one look at Machu Picchu shows its geographical situation completely tied into the network of royal roads of 14,000 miles of roads that the Inca built in less than a century. But not only is it tied into the physical existence of the empire, more importantly, it's tied into the metaphysical notions of cosmic geography. And this was all worked out by my friend Johann Reinhardt, the other explorer in residence who found the ice maiden, the perfectly preserved Incan maiden at the top of Ampato. Johann was the first to notice that the axis mundi of um, Machu Picchu, the Intihuatana, 
what Bingham called the hitching post of the sun, is a perfect shadow of its apu, which is Wainapichu, which some of you may have climbed up. The light that falls on Wainapichu falls on this aspect of the Intiwatana. Now, if you come this side of the Intiwatana, you find an altar. If you climb to the top of Wainapichu, you find the sister altar. If you draw a direct north-south bearing, you find that that line goes right between altars through the Intiwatana and then hits Salkantai, the second of the most important mountains of the Incan Empire, the mountain that literally and metaphorically brings water down the slopes to Machu Picchu. Now, when the Southern Cross is in the highest extent in the southern sky, enmeshed in the Milky Way, it too is in that perfect alignment. And the Milky Way, of course, is seen as the heavenly equivalent of the Urubamba, which, like a serpent, snakes around the base of Machu Picchu. But where is the, Ur uh, the Urubamba born? In the very snowfields of the Coyariti. So 500 years after Columbus, the people are still celebrating these rituals that link them to deep notions of sacred geography, upon which the model for the architecture of places like Machu Picchu was established. Now, if the Andes is a syncretic fusion of the two worlds that make up the reality of contemporary Peru, there is one place in South America where the pre-Columbian voice remains utterly unfettered, and that, of course, is in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, this fantastic volcanic massif that soars to 20,000 feet out of the Caribbean coastal plain of Colombia. In a bloodstained continent, the people of the Sierra, the Arawakos, the Kogi, the Wiwa, were never conquered by the Spanish. Descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization, they escaped the Holocaust of the conquest by retreating into this massif, where to this day they remain ruled by a ritual priesthood. The training for the priesthood is extraordinary. Reichel Domatov, the great Colombian anthropologist, reported in the 1940s that the acolytes are taken away from their families at the age of two and three, sequestered in a shadowy world of darkness for 18 years, two nine-year periods deliberately chosen to mimic the nine months they spend in their natural mother's womb, now they're metaphorically in the womb of the great mother. And for that entire time, the world only exists as an abstraction as they're taught the values of their society, which includes the idea that their prayers and rituals literally maintain the cosmic balance. And then, after this incredible initiation, he reported, the acolyte suddenly, at the age of 18 or 19, is taken out into the dawn and taken on pilgrimage to the heart of the world, and for the first time in his life, sees a landscape and sees the beauty for which he's been preparing himself all his life to protect through ritual. It's an extraordinary thing, and it was almost like a fable in anthropology, and no anthropologist had ever gone on one of these pilgrimages. I always wanted to do it. And then a marvelous thing happened. This young man, Danilo Villafania, walked into my office at the National Geographic with the Colombian ambassador, Carolina Barco, uh, the daughter, incidentally, of Virgilio, who did such great things in the Northwest Amazon. And he was with, with him was, were three mamos, or priests, Wiwa, Arawako, and Kogi, barefoot in the Washington winter. And as they were chatting me up, they're highly organized politically, I, I interrupted Danilo and said, I don't want to be rude, but you look an awful lot like an old friend of mine. And I showed him this photograph that I took in 1974. Well, the man on your right is his father, Adalberto, who was murdered by the paramilitaries. And I said to, I guess I can't go back, but I said, to, there we go. I said that to Danilo, you may not remember this. Uh, what do I do now? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't touch anything. And I, mean, I haven't even started to talk about zombies. <laughs> so I said to Danilo, you may not remember me, but when you were a baby, I carried you on my back with your father up and down the mountains. And based on that incredible connection, Danilo invited us to bring back a film crew and actually to go on a journey to the heart of the world. And this man here is, um, the second from the left, is actually Eugenio, who was this, the boy with Adalberto in the previous photograph. And so what we discovered that at least today, the boys don't spend 18 years in the darkness, but they do spend 18 years in the environs of the men's sacred circle on a ritual diet, much of the time, indeed, in the darkness at night, learning this incredible Baroque um, uh, set of religious ideas that have led many people 
uh, to compare the Arawakos sort of to the Tibetans of South America. And then indeed, they do go on a journey from the heart of the world. The metaphor in this culture is the loom. They say, upon this loom I weave my life. And so as a man moves up and down the ecological gradient, exploiting various niches, they describe their movements as threads, so that over the course of a lifetime, you weave a cloth over the body of the earth. When they plant a garden, the women would plant it like this, and the men like that, so if you fold it in half, you'd have a piece of cloth. And so the, the, the journey is a journey from the sea to the ice, from the ice back to the sea. And every single ripple in the landscape resonates with, with mythological significance. Uh, even the hats the Arawakos wear, woven from Saizo, are a conscious effort to mimic the ice caps that cover the Saranqua, the goddess at the heart of the world. And we were at the penultimate stage of this arduous pilgrimage when we suddenly were woken up to reality and there was a series of FARC patrols converging on this hamlet to kidnap us. And you can't have an exactly a dramatic escape on a mule. You kind of clip-clop your way to rescue. But with the, with the help of Danilo and our friends, we escaped this ambush and were able to pass our cameras over to the uh, Wiwa cameramen that we had trained, and they finished this part of the film for us. And we then went up a spectral moonlight uh, and, and emerged uh, and found ourselves that we had e entered a hornet's nest. And in fact, the 9th B Columbian Battalion was there in a firefight with the FARC. So we we're just sort of lucky uh, to escape, but it was really not that big a deal. There was lots of coca to chew. And we simply went back to the ocean where even today, though the sacred sites are still dominated by, are now dominated by high rises and whorehouses and discotheques, it doesn't stop the elder brother from doing what's necessary, the ritual offerings at the sea with items from the Paramo, from the Paramo, uh, from the sea back to the Paramo. And it's humbling to think that even as we sit here tonight, not two hours from Miami Beach, the elder brothers are praying literally for our collective well-being. They call themselves the elder brothers because they literally believe that they have in their hands the fate of the world. And they dismiss us as a younger brother and they, dis they speak in full paragraphs and full, um, with full articulation about our need to change the way that we interact with the planet Earth. Now, I've always lived by the adage of Marshall McLuhan that if it works, it's obsolete. And just when I get really into something, I, I get diverted into something else. And after six years of only thinking about plants and societies in South America, I was kind of looking for something new. And there's always a, something waiting in the fourth floor office of Professor Schultes. And one winter day in 1982, he summoned me to his office and asked me if I was interested in going down to the Caribbean island nation of Haiti, infiltrating the secret societies and securing the formula of a drug used to make zombies. Well, naturally, I said, sure. <laughs> uh, and I went off to Haiti uh, thinking that it was going to be a two-week holiday in the Caribbean and having no idea that in the end it would consume four years of my life. Because within 24 hours of arriving in the African reality, something was made uh, available to me that had eluded me in all those years in the Amazon, and that was truly a window wide open to the mystic. You know, it's interesting, if we were to ask you to name the great religions of the world, what would you say? Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever. What continent is always left out? Sub-Saharan Africa, the tacit assumption being that African people had no religion. Well, of course they did, by ethnographic definition, and voodoo is not a black magic cult. Voodoo is simply a phone word from Dahomey that means spirit or God. And all voodoo is is a series of very profound religious ideas that came over to the New World during the tragic era of slavery and became sown in the fertile soil of the continents. And in many ways, voodoo is a quintessentially democratic faith because the acolyte not has, doesn't have to go through a priest or a priestess to achieve the divine. Indeed, Haitians always said to me, you white people go to church and speak about God. We dance in the temple and become God. And indeed, Haitians move in and out of their spirit realm with an ease and impunity that astonishes the ethnographic observer. And the essence of this notion of spirit possession is not that it's some kind of psychic breakdown, but to the contrary, it's a hand of divine grace. Um, it's, it occurs when the the, the spirit mounts the rider and the rider becomes a god. And the essence of voodoo is simply a notion that the living give birth to the dead 
uh, the dead become the spirits, the spirits of the multiple expressions of the greater Godhead. It's with the spirits that the individual interacts on a daily basis, but in, a, in this quintessentially democratic faith, even the dead must be made to serve the living. To serve the living, they must become manifest. To become manifest, they must respond to the rhythm of the drums, to come up from the realm of the invisibles, to momentarily displace the soul of the living, so for that brief shining moment, human and God become one and the same. And this is the power of spirit possession. And because you're taken by the God, how can you be harmed? And that's why you see these theatrical gestures. A man in a fetish symbol in Dahomey slicing into his skin, or more profoundly, voodoo acolytes in Haiti in a state of trance, handling burning embers with impunity, a rather astonishing example of the mind's ability um, to uh, affect the, uh, the body that bears it when catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. Voodoo is not a black magic cult. The reason we have this notion of voodoo as being a dark force is largely because Haiti was the only independent black country for 100 years. It was a thorn in the side of an imperialistic age. It used to buy shipments of slaves destined for the American market and grant them freedom. It liberated, it gave the funds for Boulevard to liberate Grand Columbia on the condition he liberate the slaves. And of course, the US Marine Corps occupied Haiti for 20 years early in the 20th century, and everybody above the rank of sergeant got a book contract. And the books had names like Cannibal Cousins, Black Baghdad, Voodoo Fire in Haiti, A Puritan in Voodoo Land, The White King of Lago Nave. Uh, there were dozens of these books, all filled with zombies crawling out of the grave to attack people, pins and needles and voodoo dolls that don't exist, and of course, children bred for the cauldron. They gave rise to the RKO movies of the 40s, Night of the Living Dead, Zombies on Broadway, Zombies of the Stratosphere, and, and they essentially said to the American people, any country where such abominations occur can only find its redemption through military occupation. But voodoo is not a black magic cult. And zombies do exist, uh, but I'm not going to talk about zombies. <laughs> you can read the book. I'm so sick of zombies. Um, <laughs> but in the, end, in the end, we sort of have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of world do we want to live in? We, we have this idea that these cultures, quaint and colorful as they are, are somehow destined to fade away as if by natural laws, if they're failed attempts at being modern, failed attempts at being us. Nothing could be further from the truth. You know, technology is no threat to culture. The Lakota did not stop being Sioux when they gave up the bow and arrow in favor of the rifle any more than an American farmer stopped being an American when he or she gave up the, uh, the horse and buggy for the automobile. Uh, technology is no threat to culture. Change is no threat to culture. All cultures are always dancing with new possibilities for life. The, what is a threat to culture is power. And these cultures are not delicate societies destined to fade away, in every case to the contrary, they're dyna dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. And what are these forces? Well, in the immediate wake, I wrote this book, The Serpent and the Rainbow, about my time in Haiti, and it was made into the worst movie in Hollywood history. And Hemingway said, if you sell a book to Hollywood, you should start off in Arizona, drive to the California state line, throw your book over, and then go back to Tucson and have a drink. I, 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 I didn't do that. I disappeared in the forest of Borneo. I wanted to live in a place wet with the innocence of birth. I wanted to live with the true nomadic people of the rainforest of Southeast Asia because, you know, nomads have always fascinated me. We were all once nomads, wanders on a pristine planet. It was only 12,000 years ago during the Neolithic where we succumbed to the cult of the seed and the poetry of the shaman became the prose of the organized priesthood. And nomadic societies are profoundly different. How, for example, do you measure wealth in a society where there is absolutely no incentive, indeed there's a disincentive, to acquire personal possessions? Well, in Penan culture, wealth is explicitly defined as a strength of social relations between people, because if those relations fray, everybody will suffer. Sharing in Penan culture is an automatic reflex. There is no word for thank you in the Penan language. The greatest sanction is on those who show a disinclination to share, because if you don't share, you may not eat. 
I once gave a cigarette to a, a Penan woman and watched in my amazement as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably to every hut in the encampment, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. And similarly, in these societies that do not have the written word, there seems to be a kind of a dialogue with the natural realm, which is hard to explain. The written word, of course, was a, a wonderful development, but by definition, it was a tool designed to numb memory. But in these oral traditions, the memory is acute, and the entire knowledge of the society is encoded in the vocabulary and memory of the best storyteller. So the flight of a hornbill becomes like the curse of script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. And by the time I got to Borneo in the late 1980s, sadly, the sound of the forest had become the sound of machinery. And a time when there was so much control, concern about Amazonian deforestation, Brazil was only producing 1.3% of the tropical log exports of the world. Malaysia was producing 45% of it, much of it from the homeland of the Penan. So in a single generation, their world was turned upside down. Women were suddenly working as serfs and prostitutes in the logging camps. Rivers that once ran clear were so laden with silt that it seemed as if half of Borneo was slipping away to the South China Sea where the Japanese freighters li held light on the horizon, ready to fill their, fill their holes with raw logs ripped from the heart of the forest. Children in these forest settlement camps suffering from illnesses not known in their traditional culture. Women stunned, men humiliated, eventually standing up in this extraordinary rebellion, blowpipes against bulldozers, a quixotic gesture, electrified the global environmental community, but no match for the power of the Malaysian state. And not long ago, I was in Tibet when I got word that the last of the nomadic Penan had been forced into settlement. So within a single lifetime, a way of life morally inspired, inherently right, with a knowledge of that forest that would put any Princeton PhD to shame, has been crushed along with the forest homeland that gave birth to the vision itself. And these egregious industrial intrusions are not isolated in distant realms. This is my closest friend in Canada, Oscar Dennis, this powerful Taltan leader. And before I tell you what's going on in our homeland, I should mention that this photograph, when it was published in the National Geographic, set hearts aflutter around the world. Women from all over the world made a beeline for the small community of Iskut, northern British Columbia. And Oz would call me up and he'd say, Wade, you know, there's this uh, woman from uh, Poland here to see me. And I'd say, I'd say, Oscar, you just had someone from Moscow last week. This is ridiculous. You don't speak Polish or Russian. And what's going on here? They don't really come for conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but on a, more, on a more poignant note, I showed this photograph to our premier, Premier Campbell. And uh, I said to him, let me tell you about my friend Oscar. In the previous five years, Oscar's brother had hung himself in his mother's basement. His other brother died 10 feet from shore because he never learned how to swim. His other brother died of medical malpractice in a hospital accused of being a drunken Indian. His sister got an ICBC insurance settlement and died on the streets of Prince George. And Oscar's only daughter blew her head off playing Russian roulette with a handgun in five years. And I said to the Premier, in those five years, Barrick Gold has taken 400 tons of gold and 5,000 tons of silver out of their territory. Today's value would be $25 billion. And Mr. Premier, I'd like to know why there's not a hockey rink in Iskut, why there's not trust funds for these kids to go to college, why there's not an elders' center, why there's not a swimming pool so they can learn to swim. But this is all part of a tsunami of economic development sweeping over the north of British Columbia and of Canada. The tar sands are just one element of this um, incredible surge of industrial activity that is threatening all of our remote reaches, including this valley known to the Taltan as the sacred headwaters, whereby an amazing accident of, or miracle of geography, our three great salmon rivers of home, the Stikine, the Skeen, and the Nass, are born in remarkably close proximity. So in one afternoon, you can follow the tracks of grizzly and wolf and drink from the source of the very rivers that cradle the great civilizations of the Pacific Northwest. We've just had the good news at Shell, which had plans to put 6,500 coal bed methane extractive wellheads in this valley, are pulling out, but we're still facing a number of mineral um, uh, industrial intrusions coming right into the heart of what is the most wild 
beautiful part of North America. And without telling you too much about these developments, save one called Red Chris, where on a mountain that's a wildlife sanctuary in the sky, home to the largest population of stone sheep in the world, a resident population that attracts the greatest concentration of wolves and grizzly bear and black bear in all of Canada, a mountain that dominates nine pristine lakes of the headwaters of the Iskut River, which is the main affluent of the Stikeen. The Stikeen, a river that John Muir saw but the lower third of, and he called it a Yosemite 150 miles long, and he named his dog after that river of enchantment. The government of BC has given permission to a crummy little mining company to put an open pit copper and gold mine, which will extract 30,000 tons of rock a day for 30 years, burying pristine la uh, uh, la landscapes. And I, I want you to th think about the difference about how we industrialize the wild. What does it take to get a mine going in Canada? You cobble together a company on the golf course in Toronto, a company with less history than my dog. You go online to secure the subsurface rights to a place you've never been, the stories you've never heard, the pain of a long winter you've never experienced, nor the promise of a bright spring. And as long as you can guarantee the government a flow of revenues in the form of taxation or royalties, you can secure the right to transform that place forever. But what's fascinating is there's not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes the industrialization of the wild that puts any monetary value whatsoever on the land left alone or conversely, any cost to the commons, the rest of us who are not working for the mine, who are not invested in the mine, implicit in the destruction of that habitat. We take that as a given because it's the way we industrialize the wild, but it's highly anomalous behavior. It'd be as if I, you're growing roses in your garden here in Eugene, and I come by and I offer to buy your roses, and I'm such a good uh, character that I employ your children to cut the roses, and I, I walk away with all the roses, I look over my shoulder and I say, by the way, I'm going to destroy your house. And you say, well, what about my house? What's the compensation for the house? Well, there's no compensation. This is a transaction about roses. This is about coal. It's not about what I leave behind. Well, what would be left behind will be a landscape utterly devastated and all to benefit the very, very few. It's a level of corruption incomparable in Canadian history. And sadly, this particular mine is not four miles from my home. And, uh, and so this, this is a, uh, I've written a book called The Sacred Headwaters that I'd refer you to, but not to dwell on that, but just to show how anomalous that is. Let's go to the opposite end of the human experience in terms of how we treat landscape. Let's go to the landscape of Australia. You know, when the British first arrived in Australia, they saw people who looked strange, who had a simple material technology, but what deeply offended the British about the Aboriginal people is that they had no interest in improving upon their lot. Now, self-improvement was the ethos of 19th century and 18th century British and European society, and the British found this deeply offensive, and so in their inimitable way, they concluded that the Aboriginal people of Australia were not human beings at all, and they began to shoot them. And as recently as 1902, in the lifetime of my grandfather, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether Aboriginal people were human beings or not. Uh, as recently as the 1960s, a school book in Australia, A Treasury of Fauna of Australia, included the Aborigines as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife in that continent. But what was actually going on was a subtle devotional philosophy far beyond the reach of the British to understand, and that was the dreaming. The whole idea of Australia, we know that the Australians were the first humans to walk out of Africa. Studies of the Y chromosome have shown that. They reached this parsimonious continent, then they went walking. They established 10,000 clan territories linked by a single idea. The song line, which was a trajectory walked at the dawn of time when the ancestral beings sang the universe into existence, and the dreaming. And the dreaming wasn't a dream. It was a state of perpetual reality where past, present, and future were one and the same. In not one of the 670 languages and dialects of Australia is there a word for past, present, or future, or for time. There is only this transcendent, eternal moment. The purpose in life in Australia was not to improve upon anything. It was the opposite. It was to do the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. 
It would be as if in all of the West, all of our efforts had gone into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it just as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. The issue, again, is not to say who's right and who's wrong. Had we followed this devotional trajectory, yes, we would not have put a man on the moon, but on the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to change the biological life support systems of the planet itself. So if egregious industrial intrusions are one threat to the ethnosphere, the other, of course, is ideology. Here's a photograph I took at Angkor Wat of a Buddhist nun who's had her feet and hands severed from her body for the crime of pursuing, pursuing her religious faith during the era of the killing fields. Another gentleman at Angkor Wat who's had his leg cut off. You walk around Angkor Wat and you realize that your whole age court, cohort is simply non-existent. And if you go into Tibet, you see something of the same. When the Marxist materialist Mao Zedong, the individual incidentally uh, notorious for having been responsible for the death of more of his own people in his lifetime than Hitler and Stalin put together, when he famously whispered into the ears of the 14th Dalai Lama that all religion was poison, his holiness knew what was coming. And when the Chinese jackboot finally trampled to bed in 1959, the Holocaust that was unleashed led to the death of 1.2 million Tibetans and the destruction of 6,000 monasteries and temples. And what was it about the Buddhist Dharma that so threatened the Marxist materialists of Beijing with their ideology that had been distilled in the reading room at the British Library by this bizarre German philosopher? What was it about the Dharma? Well, it's all distilled in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was negation. He meant that shit happens. The second of the noble truths is that the cause of suffering is ignorance. By that, the Buddha didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of our own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the noble truths was the revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth and most consequential was the delineation of a contemplative practice that if followed, not only had the possibility of a transformation of the human heart, but had 2,500 years of direct empirical observation that such a transformation would indeed occur. And so I traveled on this journey with Mathieu Ricard, and you can see from this photograph that it was rather like being in Sherwood Forest with Friar Tuck. <laughs> and Mathieu was this incredible character. You know, his father was France's most famous philosopher. His mother was a great painter. Mathieu's house in Paris was a home of celebrities. He learned piano from Stravinsky. He learned photography from Cartier-Bresson. He learned anthropology from Claude Lévi-Strauss. He himself was a molecular biologist studying at the Pasteur Institute in the lab of a Nobel laureate when he suddenly realized there was no correlation between happiness, fame, and notoriety. And, and he left all of that behind and became ordained as a Tibetan monk. And he led me on a journey to the heart. And with us was Shara Barma, a close friend who's a traditional Tibetan doctor, seen here looking rather quizzically at my urine sample. <laughs> and under the guidance of the late Twisig Rinpoche, we went on a journey to the heart of the Himalaya, not to climb the mountain as Europeans do, but to be in the presence of a true wisdom hero, a bodhisattva, an individual who had transcended the realm of samsara, but stayed behind to facilitate the liberation, liberation of other sentient beings. We began at the great Shiwang Monastery at the Mani Rimdu ceremony, which remembers the transmission of the Dharma to Tibet by Guru Rinpoche in the 8th century. And then we began to move toward Everest, but again, not to climb the mountain, but to be in presence of a true bodhisattva. This was a woman who, by all accounts, had been very beautiful, she had no interest in marriage. She was poor. She was forced to marry. She escaped the wedding party by crawling down a human latrine. Covered with excrement, she turned up at the Temboche Monastery. The abbot cleaned her up, dispatched her across the 23,000-foot Nangpala into Tibet, where she became ordained as a Tibetan nun. Then she came back across the Nangpala and went into lifelong retreat. And for 45 years, she had never left a room the size of from me to this desk. She had never had the light of the sun on her face. Sherab was now treating her, and with the blessing of Trusa Rinpoche, we went to find her. We stopped on the way in this cave where Sherab, as part of his seven years of medical training, spent one full year in isolated retreat with Mantra, uh, with uh, Mathieu chanting the sutras. We finally found our way into the shadow, and this door opened on her face, and I expected 
To see a mad woman, by terms of reference of our society, she should have been. But this is what greeted us, a woman whose face radiated loving compassion, transcendence, and, uh, and heart love. And Mathieu turned to me and said, this is a proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind of Tibetan Buddhism, the serenity achieved by the practitioner of the fourth of the noble truths. And later that night, a lama said to me, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. Uh, you may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And this is the extraordinary civilization that has given so much to the world, and yet now the world stands by and allows the wrath of China to trample the spirit of Tibet. This is a photograph I took in Lhasa just in October, and every nunnery now has secret cameras to document every gesture. And here around the York, and this is the future of Tibet in the vision of the Chinese people. So the real question is, what's the world coming to and what kind of world do we want to live in? Margaret Mead, before she died, said her greatest fear was that as we drifted toward this kind of generic world, not only would the entire range of the human experience be reduced to a more narrow modality of thought, but that we would wake one day as from a dream, having forgotten that there are other possibilities for life itself. The issue isn't the traditional versus the modern, it's the rights of free people to choose the components of their lives. The, the issue isn't to freeze people in time, but to find a way that all people can benefit from the genius of modernity without that engagement demanding the death of their ethnicity. And the reason this is not just an issue of human rights and certainly of nostalgia, it's actually an issue of geopolitical survival because if there's one thing anthropology also teaches is that culture is not trivial. Culture is not decorative. It's not the songs we sing, the prayers we utter. Ultimately, culture is a body of ethical and moral values that every society places around each individual human being to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history sadly teaches us lies within all of us. It is culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, to find meaning and order in a universe that may have none, to do, as Lincoln said, to always reach for the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost and individuals, through volition or coercion, turn their backs on tradition, perhaps to dream of a level of affluence they will never achieve, but what they do achieve most commonly is a place in the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere. The result is disaffection, alienation, and out of that comes a chaos of all the points of conflict around the world. Culture is not trivial. It is a glue that holds us together as a civilization. And fortunately, finally, nation states are coming to realize that indigenous people don't embarrass a nation state, they enrich it if that nation state's prepared to accept diversity. You know, when the British first arrived in the Arctic, they took the Inuit to be um, savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong, but one did more to honor the human spirit. And what the British failed to understand is that there was no better measure of genius than the ability to survive in that harsh Arctic environment on a technology that was limited to what you could carve from bone and stone and forge from the cold. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. And when British mimicked their ways, they achieved great feats of exploration. But mostly the Europeans persisted in importing their own environments with them. And so when the last of Lord Franklin's men, for example, were found frozen to death at the Adelaide Peninsula at Starvation Cove, the young sailors were in the traces of a sled, a sled made of oak and iron in Manchester, England that weighed 500 pounds. On top of it was a dory from the ship that weighed 300 pounds. Inside the dory were all the accoutrements of a British naval officer's dinner service, including silver plate and a copy of the novel The Vicar of Wakefield. They, they expected to drag this through the great for the barren lands of Canada, through the boreal forest, hoping they might bounce into a Hudson Bay post and achieve salvation. Well, of course, they suffered a terrible death, but the Inuit moved lightly on the land. The runners of their sleds were originally made of fish, three Arctic char laid in a row and wrapped in the skin of a caribou hide. This is a photograph I took when I was polar bear hunting with the Inuit 250 miles off of Igluluk on the sea ice. That night, the temperature dropped to minus 65 Celsius before the wind came up. They simply made a igloo, we crawled into the hides, got the oil lamps going, and then we ate meat. And whatever Greenpeace will tell you, blood on ice in the Arctic is not a sign of death. It's an affirmation of life 
itself. And when I was at the tip of Baffin Island, narwhal hunting, I recorded a story which I'm going to end on tonight, which you're going to think was apophical, a typical story of an anthropologist's leg being pulled or tail being pulled. During the 1950s, a dark time in Canadian history, we forced the Inuit in settlements to establish our sovereignty in an archipelago that could have gone back to the Europeans or even to the Americans. This man's grandfather categorically refused to go into the settlement. So fearful for his life, the family took away all of his tools and weapons, thinking that that would force him into the settlement. Did it? No. Middle of an Arctic night, with a blizzard blowing, the old man slipped outside the igloo, pulled down his caribou hide and sealskin trousers, and defecated into his hand. As his feces froze, he forged it in the shape of a tool. And as the implement forged from the tool from human waste took final form, he put a spray of saliva along it, and with that implement forged from the cold, he killed a dog. He skinned the dog with it, improvised the traces of a sled with the skin of the dead dog, improvised a sled with the rib cage of the dead dog, harnessed up an adjacent living dog, and then, as they call it, a shit knife in belt, he disappeared into the Arctic night. Now talk about getting by with nothing. <laughs> now, I recorded that story, and you may think it's ridiculous. I'm not suggesting there's an assembly line making shit knives in the Arctic. <laughs> but if you've ever been in the Arctic and you leave a towel out overnight, it's a shovel by morning. And in the journals of Peter Freuken, who was with the 5th Thule expedition of Newt Rasmussen, there's a wonderful anecdote in his diary where he gets caught out in a blizzard and he's got to make shelter, so he makes a trough in the snow, gets himself in, it pulls his sled over, and then he inadvertently has made a coffin of his own making and he can't get out, and he's trapped. And in his journal, he says very casually, uh, and it was the casualness of this remark that made me think this could really happen. He said, I thought of making a shit knife, but I really couldn't maneuver, so I did this. The point is that there's no assembly line, but it shows you, at least metaphorically, the power of their ingenuity, but also the meaning of cold. Because ice isn't just something that they're dependent upon to hunt. Ice is the metaphor for their lives. It's the ebb and flow of, 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 of solid to liquid to get air that creates this sort of e ephemeral quality to, to the Inuit people. Now, this is a photograph I took of the northernmost community in the world of Kanak in northwest Greenland. Here, the people are the last to hunt with dogs in all of the Arctic. It's an incredible example of how you can live in the modern world and still be of tradition. If you go to their community, they have wonderful old Danish houses. Everybody's got a DVD. Everybody's got a cell phone. Great health cl clinic, but what you don't see are skidoos because they realize that dogs were the cultural pivot. If you hunted for dogs, you stayed freer from the cash economy. You could move over the land without fear of dogs breaking down or running out of fuel. But more importantly, the transmission of knowledge implicit in the training of dogs, father to son, mother to daughter, was a cultural glue that held their people together. So you come into the community, they have everything of the modern world except skidoos, and they have 40,000 dogs, and they are a far healthier community and, uh, as opposed to those across the way in Baffin Island, except that the ice that used to come in September and stay till July now comes in in November and is gone by March. So throughout the Arctic, the world is melting. And one of the most poignant things you see in the travels of an anthropologist is that throughout the world, indigenous people who played no role in the creation of this problem of climate change are, in their own terms of reference, trying to do something about it. That Koyariti festival I told you about, the penultimate act of that festival, traditionally, for a thousand years or more, has been not just to take the crosses back to your community, but to chip blocks of ice from the glacier, to carry the ice back to your community, to complete the sacred cycle of the divine, so elders who cannot partake in the pr principle will be there in spirit. Seeing the recession of those glaciers, they have unilaterally decided not to chip those trivial bits of ice from the glacier, severing that sacred cycle of the divine, giving so much of themselves to try to solve a problem that's not their creation. The elder brother have the Aboriginal people, the Barasana, they all are amping up their ritual activities because, you see, we see climate change as a technical problem, a political debate, a scientific challenge. For them, it's a deeply psychological, spiritual crisis because they're responsible for the well-being of the world. And if the world isn't suffering, it's because it's their fault. So in the end, I would just like to leave you with the hope that I hope that 
you'll see that we need the prayers of these young Tibetan monks, just like we need the hopes of this young Messiah I met uh, on the Masamara in the Serengeti, because for all time and for all, for all of us, um, these remain symbols of our collective geography of hope. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can skip the questions because it's quite late. Can we skip the questions or what? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. I should apologize. I'm Irish, and uh, that means you just talk as long as you want. And. Uh, I once was doing a radio interview on the CBC with a good friend of mine. I made the mistake of saying, to make a long story short, she said, too late. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure, sorry. Thank you. Allow me to break in to invite anyone in the overflow room to come down and join us. There are some seats opening up for you if you'd like to come down. Uh, we will have questions at the two mics. We'll take questions for 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you for your patience with the technical glitches. I think it was the impish spirit of uh, Luther Cressman come to remind us that we shouldn't uh, rely on technology as we talk about culture. So thanks for your patience and thanks to Wade Davis. And he will now entertain questions. I'll have a cordless mic. Raise your hands if you'd like me to bring it to you. Oh, is this? Oh, it is on. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. Um, I've been lucky enough to visit a number of the places that you talked about, and I'm also uh, privileged to bring a number of those places to students here at the university. Um, but this isn't about me. My question really is, you know, looking around the room, I'm, I'm sure that you have a very receptive audience here. And my challenge is, my question is how do I transmit um, the value of the ethnosphere and make uh, these, these cultures and these distant places real and um, to people perhaps that are skeptical, that are more interested in, in Facebook or you know, some Honey Boo Boo or whatever they're watching on television, I'm not sure. How do I become a better storyteller and inspire? And how am I going to continue to be real about what's happening in the world and not depress my students, but at the same time inspiring them to, well, I, to understand yeah, the value I mean, of the First of all, I, I, I find that these themes are appeal to such a wide range of, it's not a hard sell. I mean, I once gave a talk similar to the one I just gave you with somewhat different vocabulary to 4,000 grade threes. You could hear a pin drop. I mean, I once gave this talk to the combined Supreme Court of the United States, Britain, and Canada. Same thing. You know, you're talking about human, our common, our commonality. You know, I mean, the, I, I, I think people are always saying, you know, why, what? I think what your question is sort of saying, how do I get someone in Eugene to care if some African tribe disappears? Or, Correct. And I think the answer is, you know, um, you know, what would it matter to Eugene if some society in the Amazon slips away from history? Well, probably nothing. What would it matter to that society in the Amazon if Eugene slipped away to nothing? Probably nothing. But wouldn't the world be a more impoverished place were either event to happen? Um, y you know, most people will never see a Monet painting in a museum. Most won't ever hear a Mozart symphony performed by a wonderful symphony orchestra. But surely it doesn't mean that, you know, the world wouldn't be a weaker place were either artists not to have existed. And, and this idea that... Um, you know, to tell these stories is to indulge pessimism. It's on the contrary. I mean, the incredible, exciting thing is how um, these languages are still with us. There's still time. You know, I mean, when I first began to speak about this in 1998, uh, and I, I only I say that date very specifically because I hadn't really thought that much about language, and I was doing an, uh, I was doing an article for the National Geographic, and I stumbled upon the work of Michael Krauss at University of Fairbanks and Ken Hale at MIT. At that time, they were the only, practically the only two linguists speaking about this. And I said, why on earth, why aren't linguists screaming? And the answer is our friend Noam Chomsky, who had the cover of politics, he was untouchable, and he had a theory of deep structure 
that these languages essentially didn't matter. They were like the phenotypic expression of a deep genotype, which was deep structure of languages that was eternal, so languages would come and go. And then finally, it took voices from the outside of linguistics to cause everybody to suddenly s see that maybe the emperor had no clothes. And now, in the decade since we started talking about this, it's unbelievable. There's, cult there's language revitalization efforts going on all around the world, and uh, from academics to, I mean, it's incredible fluorescence of recognition of the seriousness of this challenge. So, uh, you know, I, I find myself very, very optimistic, actually. And, 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 and the worst thing we can ever think is that these cultures are destined to fade away, you know, and that's simply not the case. And once you know they're being driven out of existence, you can easily um, deal with the perpetrators of, the, of that destruction. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. I was little when those missionaries went down in the Amazon. <laughs> I remember it very clearly. I was wondering, is there such a, is there a phase of anthropology dealing with, um, with the resources, basically the depletion of resources from situations where people are helpless, but those resources lead to products made that we right. supposedly consume, and the consumers really have no sense of what's going on, much less to do something by not consuming products made from those things. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's a branch of anthropology per se. I, 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 think, uh, I think another way of thinking about this is, is um, you know, I talked about the ideology of, of communism, but there's also this cult of modernity. You know, we, we present this idea of modernity as if it exists outside of history and, and, and outside of culture. And all the term modernity refers, it just refers to a particular paradigm that we can trace back to Descartes. When Descartes said all that existed was mind and material, he sort of swept away all notions of myth, magic, and mysticism. As Saul Bellow said, science made a house cleaning of belief, and before you knew it, we had deanimated the entire earth, and, and, and that explains in a way how we can do what we do to the earth. Um, but that, again, is a belief system that comes specifically from that place. That's how we think. But, you know, the point I'm always trying to make is that it's not that I'm being denigrating my own culture. I'm just trying to say humbly we're not the paragon of humanity's potential. And what we are is just another worldview. And so when we export modernity as if it's the inexorable wave of history, I think we're being disingenuous in the extreme. There's not a single indice, for example, of the development paradigm that says anything about quality of life. Um, you know, per capita income can triple. It just made me, people from a non-cash agrarian background are working in sweatshop labor in a slum somewhere. Uh, life expectancy can go up. It may just mean that infant mortality has gone down. It doesn't say anything about lives lived. Even such a sacred cow as literacy doesn't always fulfill its promise. The way literacy um, often is imposed around the world is, 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 is as a package to, te to teach people to have contempt for their past. I mean, a classic incidence of, you know, when I, in, in, in East Africa, for example, uh, drought's not a cruel anomaly, it's a regular feature of climate. And so all the pastoral nomads, the Samburu, the Rindili, the Boran, the Gabra, they all want to get one child educated so they have a foot in the cash economy, which is fine, but the problem is these kids go to school and these schools are either taught by missionaries or by the nation state for whom pastoral nomads are embarrassments. So the kid comes into school as a nomad, learns a modicum of literacy in a context that te teaches him to be ashamed of his parents. So he graduates as a clerk. He can't go back because going back is going back to tradition. But what does it mean to go forward? He joins the unemployment rate for high school graduates in Kenya, 50, 40 percent. And he ends up going to Nairobi and scratching a living from the edges of the cash economy. Statistically, by the indice of the World Bank, that's all better. But it's clearly not better, you know. Mm -hmm. And and uh, th this is this this is happening all around the world. And you know, if I really felt that this thing called mo modernity was the the the, the absolute um, best possible way to live, I might be sympathetic with the Malaysian state that says you're talking blowpipes, we're talking computers. In fact, what the Malaysian state is talking about is that the Penan are an embarrassment because they live on a la on a land. Um, that the state covets for its natural resources, 
And so the state basically says, well, we can't have you be nomads. We have to make you modern, which make, means making you who you're not. And then that becomes an excuse for disenfranchising you and taking you from that land so that resource companies can get access to it. This is what happens time and time again all, all, all around the world. And I always say, you know, if a Martian anthropologist came to Earth and looked at, say, the United States or Canada, they'd see many wonderful things. And if the measure of success was technological achievement, we'd come out on top. But if they looked at our social structure, they'd say some obvious things. They look, you people revere marriage, but half your marriages end in divorce. You say you love your elders, but only 6% of your homes have grandparents and grandchildren beneath the same roof. You say you love your families, but you celebrate the slogan 24-7, implying total dedication to the workplace. And then you wonder why the average American youth by 18 has spent four years playing video games and watching television, contributing to an obesity epidemic so severe that it's called a national crisis by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You consume two-thirds of the world's antipsychotic drugs, even as you put 400 million tons of to toxic waste into your environment every year, and you live with an economic system that is by definition not sustainable, uh, and, and you're changing the biochemistry of the atmosphere. So you're many wonderful things, but you're not the paragon of humanity's potential. And we sell, we, we, we suggest that if people buy into this model, that A, they will achieve our level of affluence, ain't gonna happen, and B, that even if they achieve that level of affluence, it will necessarily imply a better life. And I think that's just simply not the case. Mm -hmm. And what, I, what I've always maintained is not to be critical of our world, but to recognize that all cultures are culturally myopic, faithful to their own interpretation of reality. The name for most tribes is the people. The implication means the other peoples are savages. The word barbarian comes from the Greek barbarous, one who babbles. If you didn't speak Greek, you didn't exist, but the Aztec had the same idea. And what I, what I maintain is that in a multicultural world, we have to destroy that parochial tyranny of cultural myopia that has haunted us since the birth of memory. And it continues to haunt us to this day. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have been in Iraq or in Afghanistan if we had even a, a clue from, of influence from anthropology. Uh, are, anyway, are you familiar with probably Kyle Onstad? What's that? Kyle Onstad. Have you, are you familiar with him? No, okay. no. Well, let's go to maybe one more or two more. You got the mic there. And, yeah. Where to next? Who do you want to be with and why? And is there a hallucinogen that you haven't tried that you'd like to? Uh, uh, I, I will say one thing about hallucinogens. Um, you know, uh, people back in the 60s and 70s, you know, I remember all these people like school teachers would say, you know, don't take these things, they're going to change you forever. And they didn't realize that was a whole bloody idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I find it really interesting that our generation you know, when you look at the sea change that's happened, women in our lifetime have gone from the kitchen to the boardroom, gay people from the closet to the altar, people of color from uh, the woodshed to the White House. You know, 20 years ago, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was considered, or 40 years ago, a great victory. I mean, no one spoke about biosphere. Now th these terms are part of the vernacular of school children. And yet, as we look at that incredible sea change, um, there's always this one ingredient in its recipe that we've expunged from record, and that's that millions of us lay prostrate before the gates of awe, having taken some weird plant. I, I always very happily say that I wouldn't write the way I write, I wouldn't think the way I write, I wouldn't have been able to come to terms with homosexuality coming from where I came from uh, had I not, you know, you know, taken some of these interesting them. But, you know, like Ram Dass said, you, you know, you get the message, you hang up. I mean, it's a little bit like if you're, if you're not crazy in your 20s, there's something wrong with you. But if you still are in your 40s, there's really something wrong with you. <laughs> I think that's as far as I'm going to go down that track. <laughs> yes. I, I won't say what famous uh, Harvard graduate brought the coca plants to Oregon, but they can grow in greenhouses in Oregon. However, you need a heat motor window to close the window in the winter. But my question is, I'm sure you've visited the Coca Museum, and all of you can visit the Coca Museum online. I'm wondering if there's any research recently about older people using the Coca plant legally. And second, I wanted to know if you'd ever read the book, The Secret of the Andes. 
No, I don't know the book, The Secret of the Andes. Okay. Well, this is a good book because it says there that the Amethyst Order, uh, the women's uh, the sister, sisterhood, and that the pilgrimage is going towards South America and not toward the East, and that the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms have been misused by the male polarity, but the pilgrimage to the South, um, uh, Lake Titicaca and the Andes, where the feminine ray enters the Earth, will reorient these kingdoms. Is there any evidence that you've seen that there's been reorientation? No, that's like, I, I think the credo of the New Age movement is if I believe it, it's true. And I, I just don't, you know, I, 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 think, I, I think that, you know, all those kinds of sort of um, millenarian notions w one has to be very careful about. I mean, they're kind of indulgences because they, it's sort of like when Shirley MacLaine goes to Peru and says that the, you know, the, 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 the stonework was done by spacemen. I mean, that's no different in its racial overtones than when the Spanish said it was done by devils. And it not only is silly, it denies the Incaic people their greatest engineering achievement, you know. And I'm, I've always felt that the body of science that we have, the body of scholarship we have is so rich, so fertile, that you don't have to imagine things. What really occurs is so much better. I mean, do you remember that book, The Secret Life of Plants? Tim, my friend Tim, just hated that book. And he was a great botanist and a great, you know, musician, poet. And he used to say to me, why would a plant give a shit about Mozart? And then he said, and even if it did, why should that impress us? They can eat light. Isn't that enough? <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, and, and I, I, the wonder of what exists, I remember when I, I studied, I, ne I never studied biology till third or fourth year of university. I, and so when I came time to learn the metabolic cycles or the, you know, the, um, um, you know photosynthesis Krebs cycle, to me, it was really easy to memorize them because they read like origin myths to me. And the night that I figured out photosynthesis in detail, I was actually, I think I was the only student ever thrown out of the Harvard Science Library for making too much noise because I was literally ecstatically happy. I was screaming at anyone who would listen. You know, do you know how this works? And, and I've always found in, in science um, the divine. And so I don't think we need to make stuff up. Um, we can find in what really exists through scholarship worlds of wonder beyond anything um, beyond our imaginings. I remember once when I was a tutor at Harvard, one of my kids, and I was a tutor in the, in the hippie dorm, and uh, one of the kids, smart kid, but he gave me this term paper with this, this reference. I said, you know, Ralph, I think there's something wrong with that fact. And said, well, where'd you get it? You know, oh, it's really good source, Wade. Well, Ralph, where'd you get it? I impeccable, Wade. Ralph. Well, it turns out the factoid came from the back of a celestial seasoning tea package. <laughs> so I said, I said, Ralph, this is Harvard. This will not do. Well, anyway, let's, let's wrap it up. Thanks very much, you guys. <laughs>